Good afternoon everyone, hope you are well. Welcome back to my Daughter Rise um, YouTube channel. Hope you're all well. Um, today I've just been in my house, in my office, just working on my book. I've been working on my um, second book now for about four months and it's a bit more trickier than my first book which is Daughter Rise, uh, my autobiography. You can get that book via my website www.daughterarise.org.uk or you can get it on Amazon and um, that book is about my journey from devastation to restoration after going through childhood sexual abuse um, some of the challenges I've had and how I've overcome them so if you are interested in getting that book I will leave links in the description box um, below but the books that I'm working on now, I'm working on currently two books. One is about um, empowering um, people who have been through sexual abuse. And the other book is a book on affirmations, which is positive encouragement in challenging times. I've been working on both of those books, as I said, for four months. It has been challenging, but I've been really enjoying it because I'm passionate about writing and passionate about helping people who have been affected by... Um, the same issues that I have faced or secondary issues in the aftermath of abuse. But today what I want to do is talk to you about sexual vulnerability. Now some of you may have watched my first video um, part one on sexual vulnerability and I was talking about the reason why I did that video because I know so many people who have been through sexual abuse in their childhood and they use, sex, they use sex, their bodies use sex as a way of either trying to um, reclaim something that was taken from them in childhood um, because of the powers of powerlessness that they felt during that time. They use sex in adult relationships as a form of trying to regain back some type of control or using sex as a form of self-punishment so not having sex because they really enjoy sex or care for sex they just have sex um, to, and it reaffirms those negative feelings of feeling um, that they spoiled goods that they're not good enough um, and that they're not worthy to be loved all these things kind of reaffirm negative feelings and um, they're not good in the well-being and the continued healing that a person who has been through sexual abuse needs. So I wanted to kind of recap on that and kind of talk about some of my experiences and also to kind of give some little hit, some little kind of tips on things that can kind of help you to start maybe putting boundaries in place. As always, I do have my notes because as I've explained before, because of the subject matter, I do want to try and get in as much in a short period of time. And also as well, it just helps me to be able to kind of, you know, bring home the message of what I am trying to say. So in terms of sexual vulnerability, as I said, um, I have been on both sides of the coin. I have used sex to um, control, to use it as a form of control um, in, you know, relationships. As I mentioned to you, I went through a period where I was promiscuous, meaning that I didn't have really exclusive relationships as such. Um, and also as well, I've used sex as a form of self-punishment. So when I was feeling down, destructive, I would, you know, obviously I had these kind of boyfriends around me and then I would have I would have sex and it, it didn't make me feel good about doing that because really what I wanted was to be valued to be loved to be held um but a lot of times you know it would just end up in having sex and you know it wasn't really good for my well-being so I've been in the, both of those situations where I have not used sex in a positive way so after I had my first breakdown in my early 20s, um, I went into psychotherapy. I had a very good therapist and it was the first time in my life I, would, I actually, from the time I entered the care system at 13 till um, I had my first breakdown at around 22, it was the first time engaging with mental health services where I actually faced my issues. 
yes, I had, um, I had, I had um, access to therapy and support groups and other means of getting help to address those issues. But because I was so dysfunctional, I didn't engage in those. I didn't engage in the help that was offered to me. It was only after I had my first breakdown, as I said, around 22 years old, I had come out of hospital, I was on medication, um, part of my um, being released from hospital was that I engaged with mental health services and I was in psychotherapy for two years. And one of the issues that we looked at, looked at besides the issues um, and my experience of sexual abuse, we me and my therapist, we looked at my self-destructive behaviour. One of those behaviours being having like meaningless sexual relationships and using sex, as I said, as a form of control or using sex to um, as a form of self-punishment. Um, and I was only just hurting and destroying myself because this was my body and I was engaging in this self-destructive behaviour. So I had, a, as I said, a succession of, of short-lived relationships and my therapist at the time set me a, a task of, uh, yeah, she set me a task of an exercise of not sleeping with anybody for a month. Um, and I must say it was hard because when I had feelings of feeling down and depressed or lonely, that self-destructiveness of wanting to do something like, you know, smoking or whatever it is, drinking, um, having, you know, calling up one of these boyfriends or whatever, um, these kind of things kept coming up, the wanting to be loved, the wanting to, to, to be held. But because I couldn't establish those boundaries, it always used to end up in, um, in, 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 in having sex. Um, I was told to keep a diary of I was called to keep a, I was called to keep a diary of um, how I felt during this time and I found the exercise really really helpful because it helped me to engage in why I was behaving the way I was and it made me think about the emotions I was having at the times that would kind of trigger these type of um, episodes so I have got a diary entry that I kept, because I keep all my diaries from, over the last 20 years I've kept diaries, over 20 years, because I've kept them as a way of kind of reflecting on my journey from my past experiences, and also as an encouragement to myself. But I did manage to find a diary entry, I'll just get that. Um, I did find a, di a diary entry from the 15th of the 1st, 2000, and it was talking about, you know, how I was feeling during this kind of task that the therapist had set me not to sleep with anybody for a month. So it says here, um, I'm determined to put my past behind me. I feel quite, um, feel quite um, solemn inside, but I don't feel as depressed. I'm thinking about me and my future. I have to turn my life around. I don't need sex. And it doesn't, and I don't want it to feel like it used to. And because I'm working through my issues, it is not feeling so bad. So basically, that is what I wrote during that time when I was doing the task that the therapist had set me. I thought at first it was quite hard um, and I found it challenging. But I, I, probably by week, week three and four, I felt really, I felt better about myself. I felt like I had, but I was starting to gain back some control of my body, of my choices, because that's one of the things when you go through sexual abuse, it has a tendency to rob you of the ability to think, I have choices. You know, I have a choice where the friends I keep, I have a choice about the people I choose to have in my life, I have a choice whether to say yes or no to certain things. And that stems from the power, powerlessness I felt as a child. Having an adult take something from you that was so precious, not knowing what it is and not being able to stop it, even with all the will in the world, all the kind of um, the kind of thinking in your head, you know, if I do this, if I do that, then maybe I 
you know, my father would leave me alone. If I go to bed early, if I be more of a good girl, then maybe my father wouldn't do these things. And even with all those if we, even with all, the, all those kind of actions and thoughts, it still didn't stop my father from doing what he did to me. So the power of my choice, the power of my voice, the power of choices was taken away from me at a young age. And because I didn't know how it would affect me as I grew up, teenagers getting into these kind of, this succession of short-term relationships, um, and even being in some of those situations, actually, and even if it got past that stage of hugging and kissing, still not feeling like I had still had a choice that I could say no. And, you know, having not been able to establish that boundary always led into other actions. So by week three and four of the, the task, I actually felt it felt good. It was difficult, but it felt good. It felt good to be able to say, actually, I'm making this choice not to call so-and-so for them to come around and keep my company because a lot of the time as well I was lonely um, and you know you call around male company or whatever and one thing leads to another and as I said because I couldn't really set boundaries it always used to end up in these type of situations um, so doing this exercise really did help me and after the month we reviewed and we looked at it uh, me and the therapist and I decided to continue on with that yes I still had times where I fell into the trap it's taken me a long time to learn and undo some of the negative and destructive things that I have carried from my childhood mindset from a mindset of being broken by abuse and it's something that I've been learning slowly um I needed to learn actually the, to, and recognize the emotional triggers that used to end up with me being in these situations. So for instance, um, as I said, boredom, being in the house, lonely, wanting company, um, emotional triggers, memories of abuse, um, arguments with family and friends. Back in that time around 21, 22, I still had kind of contact with like uh, my natural mom and certain family members and sometimes when I used to get into conversations with them or or found it hard to articulate my feelings with them because we didn't have those type of relationships it used to emotionally trigger me back to being a child of feeling powerless and stuff and then I would go and do these things of you know um, you know having sex and things like that to try and reclaim back some type of reclaim back some type of control so I had to learn to recognize these emotional triggers um, and yeah there was lots of situations like that with families and friends you know it used to take me back to those feelings and the chaos feeling that chaos of those kind of memories um, didn't help me and that was one of the things that would cause the emotional triggers Another thing that I found was being around pe being around other people that embraced dysfunctional lifestyles. So, for instance, having friends who um, didn't think anything about having numerous boyfriends. Because lots of us back in the early twenties, from you know teenagers to early twenties, did have boyfriends. And it was nothing to have short-lived relationships and stuff like that. That's how it was back then but for me because of my additional issues I realized that these things weren't good for me so I had to kind of remove myself slowly from uh, from being around certain friends because whilst they hadn't been abused and couldn't understand um and couldn't understand my issues I kind of could see that kind of kind of um the, the link between you know what was triggering triggering me to do these behaviors and this type of environment you know, and being around this type of, um, um, being around friends that kind of were, were, were in that, but in it because of, you know, whatever, they didn't mind that, was not helping me. So I had to learn to kind of remove myself from certain relationships. So boredom, dysfunctional friends, um, and emotional trick and, and emotional triggers and boredom, all these things didn't help. Um, so... One other thing I would say is that to reduce the, to reduce the vulnerability, you have to decide to want to do it for yourself. You have to decide if it's something that you don't feel comfortable. You recognise when you're doing it, 
getting yourself into situations that make you feel sexually vulnerable and you're unable to handle that and you don't feel comfortable with that, you have to want to decide that you want to do something about it. And yes, it will involve maybe seeking uh, mental health, um, access to mental health help, getting support from organisations like Daughter Arise who can help um, kind of support you through making changes and also look at um, sourcing other help for you to be able to kind of get on the get on the right path but it's important that you have to want to do it for yourself and in doing that um, making 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 a commitment to want to do that that is the first step and it's the biggest step it's not the easiest step but it's uh, it is the biggest step of the journey when you have support to be able to follow it through everything becomes everything becomes easier um, and that can take time. I mean, that journey from me being 22 to what? Probably 10, 22 to 24. Um, I would say it took about two years for me to completely just, you know, this is not what I want. This is not what I want. And those episodes became less and less. Also as well, finding new hobbies. When you're feeling kind of vulnerable and low within yourself and that need to be loved, that need to be held, um, can be quite strong and you will find yourself getting yourself into these situations but also it's important as well to look at other avenues that can help you to kind of focus on yourself. Um, new hobbies can create new confidence um, and also add to self-worth. Doing something that you have desired to do um, but never had the confidence to getting help to do it can help to add to your self-worth and confidence. And removing yourself from those situations also will help you with your with self worth, and it helps to function your to function your mind on other things. Um, finding new friends or putting yourself in putting yourself around other people who maybe have had the who have had similar experiences to you can make the journey also easier. Um, one thing that, as I said, that I've learned, if you are trying to go in one direction and you have friends who are not going in the same direction as you and actively can't understand your issues and, you know, kind of still encourage you to do certain behaviours, it will eventually drag you down. You need to kind of surround yourself with the right, with the right people. If you don't have the right people around you, as I said, this organisation, Daughter Arise, um, I will leave the um, website link in the box below, can help to kind of give you that support to make that transitional kind of change on that journey. Um, so what if you get a situation where now you're on this journey, you've made the commitment in your mind to say, yes, this is not something I want to do anymore. And all of a sudden, one of, one of your boyfriends, ex-boyfriends calls you, wants to come around. What would you, what would you do? Um, I know how easy it is to fall and not because you, because you don't want to disappoint or you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. You, 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 you find it hard to say no. You're not really hurting their feelings, but because of your inability to kind of set the boundary, it makes you feel like you're going to hurt that boyfriend's feelings if he can't come around and you let him come around. But now that you've kind of said, yes, okay, this is what I want to do. And um, I found that, you know, it was not an easy thing to do, but I had to just say, no, I'm busy and stuff. And it was very, very hard. I didn't always get it right. It didn't start like that. But because I knew that I had already made that decision in my mind that I am taking that first step to um, not putting myself in those situations anymore, um, it made it easier to, to follow through because my heart had already been set on that decision. So they want to come around to the house, they want to come over for a chat, all those type of things. I used to say yes before and then they'd come around and one thing would lead to another and then I'd end up in a situation that used to make me feel terrible afterwards. So I would just, yeah, say, no, sorry, I'm busy. Even if I wasn't busy, that's what I would say, just to avoid not being in those situations. Having, finding, um, finding new hobbies, like I, I liked to go to the gym, um, I'd maybe go and see a friend that wasn't involved in those type of lifestyles. I used to like to write. Doing something else that kind of takes your mind off the, the need or the feeling to um, those destructive feelings when they come up can um, also help.
important thing to remember is is that you have to set the boundaries before you're actually in the situation. So if it's even saying no to being around dysfunctional friends, no to boyfriends, uh, ex-boyfriends or um, boyfriends coming around, you have to set the boundary before you're in it. So if you the if you say yes, you can come around knowing that actually I don't want this, you will find yourself back in that situation. That is what happened with me. Sex is meant to be something that is part of love. Um, sex is something that is so precious because it's given of ourself in an intimate way. And it's very hard because when you have had that distorted in childhood, sex becomes this, this valueless thing where it is, not, it is not cherished because it has caused so much trouble within your life. For me, that's what it felt like. Sex to me was nothing. It's, sex to me was nothing, but it is everything. Being now in a, in, in a loving relationship, in a marriage, I understand that. At the time, I didn't understand that. But I, what, one thing I did know is that when I stopped engaging in that type of behaviour, after a few weeks, I remember feeling how good I felt about myself. When we continue to do that, when, when you continue to have sex, meaningless sex, not setting boundaries and stuff, it just reaffirms negative things within yourself. Negative things that I'm spoiled goods, that I'm unlovable, that I'm worthless, you know, because that is what attracts these guys, you know. Um, if they cared anything about you, they would, you know, treat you different. But the fact that they are only there for sex or, you know, they're not looking to make any commitments or whatever. And even if they don't want to make any commitments, they're just having the option of saying, actually, I will choose who I, I have sex I have sex with. Ideally, it'd be lovely if you were in a loving, committed relationship. Um, because it, that is when it's at its most powerful, being having that feeling of feeling that sex is valuable and is is cherished. But just having the option of saying, actually, this is my body and I'm taking back control over it. You may not have had control over it, uh, um, over your body as a child because of the adults who, the adult who may have abused you or the older sibling or the cousin or the uncle or the family friend who has abused you, you know, has taken that and distorted that and manipulated and took away your choice. But even as an adult, even in um, you trying to reclaim back your life, trying to um, establish boundaries in trying to not you you know use use sex as a form of control um, or self punishment. This is your body. This is your choice. You have now a choice, and it it can take a, it can take time to understand that. And there is certain mindsets that need to be broken down. There's certain um, things. Um, help and support that you need to get to be able to build up a different mindset to be able to establish boundaries but you know you are worthy of those rights you know um you're not spoiled goods you're not unlovable you know um yes you won't get back what's, what was taken from you in your childhood um the innocence the, the loss of your innocence but in its place you can have something you can have something that is that is much more than that. It will never be the same because you only get one childhood. But you can have you can build you have an opportunity now to build something different. Um, being used, being mistreated, um, being destructive to yourself is is not self love, and you know ultimately it will destroy it will destroy you. And that is the honest truth. Um, I know how how unhappy I felt in that situation. So I just want to finish by reading you um, something about what love actually is and it is from um, the Bible and it is in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 to 7 and it says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That is true love. I never had that love from my parents growing up. Maybe you haven't had that love within your family or even in the aftermath of all that you've been through. But that is love. Being used is not love. And I would encourage you, if you're somebody who, who in your heart knows that being in these situations is making you deeply unhappy and you're, you want to do something about it, I would encourage you to seek help. If you would like me to pray with you, um, you can contact me at, at info.com info at daughterarise.org.uk um, and you can email me if you want me to pray for you um, in this situation or if you want to talk to me or get in contact with me about maybe taking those first steps to building back your life you know being sexually vulnerable being sexually vulnerable is something that you don't want to be in anymore and you want to build boundaries, you know, I can help you to maybe look at getting help with that. And yeah, I hope that you have found this video helpful. So please just remember, you know, it's important to just think about those emotional triggers. What triggers you? Write it down. When you're feeling so low about yourself, depressed, lonely, isolated, Think about the situations that you're in. Write them down. Because in recognising those emotional triggers um, can kind of help you to be able to kind of help you before you get into those type of situations. And I hope that, you know, um, you get the help that you need. It's not going to be easy to break certain behaviours that you've been used to, but it can be done. So I hope you found this video useful and I will see you